Hello again. Welcome to Astronomy Toronto. I'm your host, Randy Atwood, and I'm the president of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Astronom Astronomy Toronto is Toronto's astronomical news magazine. We're seen here monthly, the first Thursday of every month, here on Rogers Cable TV. Well, two years from now, Halley's Comet will be gracing our skies. And tonight we're going to have a bit of a preview of what exactly we, we expect to see. We'll look at what comets are and also the past, present, and the future of this particular comet, Halley's Comet. Well, with me today again is my friend from the McLaughlin Planetarium, Ian McGregor, who is a producer at the McLaughlin Planetarium. And he writes many of the school shows there. So uh, I guess he's uh, quite an expert on comets right about now, preparing for this apparition with Halley's Comet. Thanks again, Ian, for coming today. Thanks for inviting me, Randy. Well, let's start at the beginning. What exactly is a comet? Well, Randy, basically a comet is a dirty snowball, but it's a very, very large dirty snowball. It consists mostly of, uh, of ice, but it has a lot of rock and uh, dust mixed in with it. And it's an object which is orbiting around the sun. Now, actually, there are thousands and thousands of comets that orbit the sun. And Halley's Comet is just one good example of a, of a comet. Uh, we can perhaps uh, go along and have a look at, a, at some pictures of, uh, of comets and different aspects of them. and. Uh, and you know, discuss their, their various features. Essentially, a, a comet has got um, uh, it, uh, the coma and a tail to it. Uh, in our picture, the, uh, the coma on the left uh, contains a very small nucleus. It's only a few kilometers in diameter. Uh, as the comet goes around the sun, the material falls off the sun. The comet, the comet breaks up and forms a large uh, comet, um, uh, a spherical mass of, uh, of ice around the nucleus of the comet. The tail is the most spectacular part. Uh, whereas the nucleus may only be a few kilometers in diameter, the tail may be hundreds of thousands of kilometers or millions of kilometers in diameter. Uh, in our next slide, we can see a look at the different aspects of, our, of a comet. Uh, a comet has got basically these three different components, the coma, the nucleus, and the tail. Um, they also travel in uh, orbits around the sun. In our next slide, we can have a, uh, a quick look at the orbit. Uh, we can see that uh, we have the tail uh, always pa facing away from the sun. This is because the tail essentially, although it can be hundreds of thousands of kilometers long, consists practically of practically nothing. And the radiation from the sun pushes the tail away from the sun. And so in this diagram, we can see that the, the, uh, uh, the tail is always pointing away from the sun. Uh, comets also move in rather unusual orbits, as we can see in our next slide. Whereas the planets move in circular orbits around the sun, uh, basically circular orbits. Uh, cometary orbits are essentially flattened circles or ellipses. And in this particular case, we're looking at the orbit of a comet known as Encke's Comet. And we can see that its orbit uh, passes over the orbits of several of the other planets in the solar system. Well, why are comets so important for us to, to uh, investigate, Ian? Well, there are perhaps several different things about comets that are, are of interest. Uh, first of all, of course, comets are very beautiful objects in the sky. Uh, we don't see them that often as far as bright ones we can see with the eye or a small telescope, uh, but they are rather interesting when they come in the sky, suddenly sort of appear, they're almost like ghostly images in the sky. Uh, traditionally in the past, comets have always been associated with uh, oh, sort of evil omens, destruction, uh, um, death of great people, uh, destruction of empires, things like that. Usually when a comet comes around, something bad happens, so it's nice to blame it on the comet. You can blame it on the comet rather than blaming it on something else. Uh, in 1910, for example, people were coming along passing out comet pills, and uh, they were talking about the danger of the Earth passing through the tail of Halley's Comet, and people were handing out gas masks and things like that. But uh, and even, even in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a fairly bright comet that passed by us, and people were uh, scared of it. But actually, our ideas about comets have changed a great deal. We know what a comet is now. It's a, it's a large snowball traveling around the sun. Uh, our special interest in comets comes from the fact we think these are very old uh, bits of material. Um, they go back, um, probably they formed about the same time as the solar system formed. Uh, so we're looking at primordial material from the time the planets and the sun formed, uh, material dating back perhaps about four and a half billion years. Well, um, one question I've, I've often a wanted to ask is the fact that you see a lot of comets in picture books, uh, but we really don't see them if we're just looking up in the sky on an average night. How often do these comets come around? 
And the average year an astronomer observes maybe 15 to 20 comets in the sky, but most of those are very faint. You have to have a, a very large telescope in order to see them. As far as a bright comet that perhaps the average person could see using their eyes alone or a pair of binoculars, small telescope, that event might take place maybe only once every maybe four or five years. Uh, so on, like the, on the average they're not very bright? On the average they're not very bright. Most of them are very faint. Now, there are, of course, there are lots and lots of comets. Um, the uh, astronomers believe that there's an enormous cloud of comets that surrounds the solar system. It's what we call Oort's cloud. And we think there may be millions and millions of comets in this cloud. Every so often, um, one of them gets sort of bumped into a sort of a death ride in towards the sun. Uh, comes in, moves in towards the sun, um, crosses the orbits of the various planets. As it approaches the sun, it starts to break up the sun's radiation sort of starts to destroy it, um, passes by the sun, and then it zips, sort of thrown back out, out into the outer solar system. For most of a comet's life, it is in the depths of space. And it's, it's sort of only, its moment of glory may only last maybe really a few months at the most. Last year in particular was a very good year for comets. 1983 was what they're calling a banner year. There was quite a few. How many were seen? Banner year. Most like about 22 comets were observed during the year. And uh, that's an incredible number. Um, of course, we had a, a satellite up in Earth orbit known as the IRIS, the Infrared Astronomy Satellite, and it discovered six comets during the course of the year. And we can expect that, uh, well, probably eventually we're going to have more than 22 comets observed in the sky. I think the next slide will give us an idea of what uh, the IRIS Iraqi Alcock comet looked like. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see a slide that wasn't taken by a professional astronomer, it wasn't taken by a, a large telescope but it was taken by myself. And uh, in the middle, you see a fuzzy bluish object. That's the comet. All the other stars are just uh, are in the field of view, but the fuzzy thing there is the, the comet. Middle. That's a very good picture, Randy, too. That's a, uh, that was a very incredible comet that passed by us last spring. Passed by incredibly close. Oh, heavens, from uh, just about six nights, it went almost right across the sky. An incredible sight. Thousands of people observed it. You didn't need a, a big telescope to see it. You could have seen it in a small telescope, or you could see it with the eye if you were in a, a dark sky. Well, let's look back now, back at uh, the just several spectacular comets that have been seen in the last thousand years, and maybe compare them to what we what Halley's comet is, which is one of the brighter ones. During the course of time, there have been a great number of uh, bright comets, or uh, particularly caught human attention. And perhaps we can look at a series of pictures now, which show the, the different comets. This, for example, is a, a woodcut from 684 A.D., and it's the earliest depiction that we have of Halley's comet. Now, 684 AD is not particularly old as far as comets are concerned. We have records going back uh, perhaps about a thousand years before that of comets. Uh, another picture of Halley's Comet is the next slide, and this is showing us the so-called Bayou Tapestry. Uh, it dates from about the year 1066 AD, and right in the very top of the picture, we see what looks like almost like a rocket ship with you know, jets coming from behind it. And that is actually Halley's Comet, which was observed in 1066. Uh, King Harold uh, of England is over to the right, and in, th in those days it was thought that uh, this comet was an evil omen for Harold. Of course, he later met his death at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, we then come along, move along in time to more recent times, and this is a, a, a photograph, uh, sorry, a, a woodcut of uh, a comet of the year 1577. It was observed by the very famous Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Uh, previous to 1577, people thought that comets were uh, things that were in the Earth's atmosphere, relatively close to us in space. But Tycho's observations of this particular comet over the course of several weeks showed to him that a comet is far away in space. Also, you can see here that the tail is getting longer. So in these uh, progressions that we, with that slide, you can see that probably that comet's getting very close to the sun there with the, the tail being so long. That's right, and then the tail's getting very spectacular. And it must have been a very impressive sight in 1577 when, when Tycho saw it. Uh, we move into our, our next slide. We go into the 18th century, and we get one of the most beautiful comets that has been in the sky. Um, this is uh, what was known as the Shenant Sows Comet. It was observed in the year 1744, and it had six tails, an incredible sight. In fact, the Shannon Sows Comet is the second most famous comet of the 18th century. The most famous comet of that century was Halley's Comet that came along about 15 years later. Then another comet of the 19th century is Donati's Comet. Uh, this comet was uh, year 1858. It's considered one of the most uh, beautiful comets seen in the sky. It had three tails and that was extremely bright in the sky. And then another famous comet of the 19th century is shown in the next slide, 
This is the so-called Great Comet of 1882. It was what we call a sun grazer. It came very, very close to the sun, and in fact, it was observed to break apart. And, uh, and instead of having one comet, it broke into four pieces. It, we will probably not see that comet again. Well, I guess we're all looking forward to now Halley's Comet. The last apparition, the last approach of Halley's Comet was in 1910, and a lot of people saw that, uh, that comet come by. A lot of people were looking for that particular comet. Um, it had been uh, observed previously in 1759, 1835, uh, as far as mo most recent returns, and everyone was looking forward to 1910, this very, very famous comet. Um, it was very bright that year, but interestingly enough, it wasn't the brightest comet of the year 1910. Uh, the first comet observed in 1910 was observed around January, February, and it, in fact, was brighter than Halley's Comet. Our next slide shows Halley's Comet as it was seen in 1910. Uh, we can see the head of the comet, the very long tail. Uh, the tail was about 20 degrees long across the sky. and uh, That's quite large, isn't quite it? Quite large. It was probably maybe, um, maybe 50, 60 million kilometers long, uh, an incredible length. And, and um, people who observed it gave very favorable reports of what they saw. Now in Toronto, we were fortunate enough to be able to see it, anybody who was in Toronto in those days. Um, and we have some newspaper headlines in our next slide which show uh, what people thought about the comet in those days. Uh, a lot of people were speculating that the, we might be able to see uh, that the Earth might pass through the actual tail of the comet. That's why they're worried about these comet pills and things like that. But in actual fact, the Earth is thought to have missed the tail of the comet. In our next picture, we've got uh, sort of an announcement that was in the, in the Globe and Mail that uh, observers in Toronto were going to be able to see the comet. And uh, I think it must have caused a great deal of, of interest in those days. Certainly. Now the, now the comet also um, changes its, the length of its tail. And I think perhaps in our, our next slide I can show you some uh, photographs, a series of 14 pictures of the comet's tail over the course of uh, two months. And it shows how, uh, well, I guess in the top frame on the left we have the uh, hardly any tail at all. And then as we go from across the top to the right, the tail's getting longer and longer. And then we go across the bottom and the, the, the tail is shortening up again. And around April, the tail was at its longest. Well, of our many members of the Royal Astronomical Society, we have uh, one member, Mr. Bill Stevenson, who remembers seeing Halley's Comet. And what we'd like to do is uh, we have a videotape of Mr. Stevenson describing what he saw when he was six years old back in April 1910, his description for you of what Halley's Comet really looked like. Northern Ireland in 1910, the 23rd of April, about 11 o'clock a.m. Describe it. And uh, it was uh, quite uh, visible and quite bright at that time in the morning. The sun was within, within an hour of the meridian, uh, which, if the sky had uh, uh, been with a darker background, it would have been much brighter, of course. Um, I was with a party of um, surveyors, and I distinctly heard one of the surveyors say that from the natural horizon, it was 30 degrees uh, right ascension. And um, they measured the, from the nucleus to the tip of the tail, they measured with the left hand uh, between the two four fingers. And uh, the tail was slightly curved to the, at the end, uh, but um, straight from the sun with a slight curve, almost like the horn of, a, of an elephant, a tusk of an elephant in that shape. Well, I guess you're really looking forward to... Yes, I am looking to, uh, forward very, uh, with a lot of interest to the second return. After Halley's Comet, since 1910, and I guess there have been several interesting comets, probably not as bright as what Halley's looked like in 1910. We've not actually had that many uh, bright comets in this century. The 19th century seemed to have a much better selection. But there have been some bright comets recently that I can, we can perhaps briefly mention. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous comets of this century was in 1965, and our next slide shows that. Uh, this is a comet uh, known as a Keiaseki. It's named after the two uh, Japanese astronomers that discovered it. It was another sun grazer like the Comet of 1882, 
and it was also observed to break up after it passed by the Sun. Uh, more recently, we get to the next uh, slide, and we have a picture of Comet Bennett. This was observed in 1970. It was observed by a, a, a South African astronomer by the name of John Bennett. If you discover a comet, it's named after you. And that was a very spectacular sight that many people saw. And then much more recently, we come to, I guess, the last bright comet that we've had in our skies. And that was uh, 1975, 1976, a comet known as Comet West. And that's shown in our next uh, picture. Uh, Comet West was visible in March of 1976. It was a, uh, a naked eye object for about four days. Unfortunately, in southern Ontario, the weather was simply terrible, and you had to get up just before sunrise in and order I to catch it. You should point out, too, that Ian, you took this slide up before sunrise and a uh, beautiful little wisp of white in the sky just as the dawn was coming up. Quite a beautiful sight. Oh, story. it's an incredible sight. Three tails, easily visible with the eye, and binoculars and telescope. Incredible. Well. Now let's, let's talk about this upcoming apparition of Halley's Comet in 1986. Uh, recently, at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Royal Canadian Institute, there was a, a talk by Dr. Ian Halliday, and Dr. Halliday is from the Hertzberg Institute in Ottawa. Dr. Halliday talked on Halley's Comet, and uh, what we'll do now is go to some videotape of really who Halley was, what the comet was, and maybe what we'll expect to see. So let's go to that videotape now. Two of the most fascinating natural spectacles that I think anyone can witness are a total eclipse of the sun and a bright comet. In the case of a total eclipse, the path of totality is limited to a rather narrow band on the Earth's surface, the order of a few tens of miles in width, and the duration of the event is a few minutes at most. Uh, the number of people and who will naturally find themselves within this path on any particular occasion is relatively small. If you stay put on the surface of the Earth, it would take perhaps something like 300 years for a total on the average for a total eclipse to pass over your location. So generally, not many people have witnessed a total eclipse of the sun except for people such as the uh, avid eclipse chasers of the Toronto Centre who may have witnessed seven by travelling as they do today to all parts of the world to be there for those few precious minutes of totality. Now, a bright comet is more accessible to people in the sense that it is generally visible in at least one hemisphere of the Earth, the northern or southern hemisphere, at a particular time. The duration of the event is likely to be measured in a few weeks, uh, so that most people have had a chance to see a bright comet at one time or another in their lives. Of all comets, the most famous, no doubt, is Halley's Comet, and most people get a chance to see it once in their life, one stretch of a few weeks, because Halley's Comet comes around the sun once every 75 or 76 years, which is approximately a human lifetime, and our chance is coming up in the next two years. Perhaps this is a, as good a place as any to comment on the pronunciation of the name of this comet. Uh, I shall call it Halley's Comet. Uh, there are those who maintain, perhaps with uh, good justification, that in England, at the time of this famous astronomer, it would have been pronounced Holly. So Holly or Halley are equally uh, valid pronunciations. Haley, I think, is not and uh, in general should perhaps be avoided. The comet is named after Edmund Halley, who was uh, an English scientist of two and a half centuries ago, born in 1656 and died in 1742. Halley came from a well-to-do family, had a, an excellent education, and became uh, a very prominent astronomer and mathematician. But like many scientists of his day, he was versatile. Scientists at that time did not confine themselves or specialize to the extent that we do today. So he was also uh, a geophysicist. He was also interested in military science aspects uh, and a, a great diversity of interest, archaeology, anything of scientific interest would usually find Edmund Halley involved. But primarily he was an astronomer and a mathematician. He was also a friend and close advisor of Isaac Newton. And in fact, it was Halley who encouraged Newton to continue with his studies 
and finally to publish his famous works, the Principia. Uh, and Halley, in fact, uh, paid for the publication of that book. So uh, his was a, a very important influence on the history of astronomy at that time. There's no evidence that Halley made any great or significant observations of the comet which bears his name. Uh, it appeared in the apparition of 1682, when Halley would have been 26 years old, so most likely he saw it. Uh, his contribution was that a decade later, he reached the conclusion that the three bright comets which had been recorded in 1531, 1607, and 1682 were in fact reappearances of the same object. And 10 years after he reached this conclusion in 1705, he published this and predicted at that time that the comet would reappear, that it would reappear in fact in 1758. Uh, there was no chance that Halley would live to see that. He would have been 102 had he done so. Uh, but he made it quite clear that he wished uh, history to record that it was an Englishman who had made this prediction if it should come true. And sure enough, when the comet showed up on schedule, it was named Halley's Comet, and we have known it as such ever since. Dr. Halliday, what makes Comet Halley so special? Well, the important thing about it is that it's a uh, very reliable comet. It shows all kinds of cometary activity. It's got the two kinds of tail, both the dust particles and the electrified gas particles. Uh, it's got a big halo around it. It shows every type of cometary activity. It's predictable. It comes around every 75 or 76 years. The, uh, this gives you the chance to uh, plan your observation. The, Amateur astronomer, the casual uh, person who wants to watch Halley's Comet, is going to have a rather difficult time uh, this apparition uh, because the geometry is somewhat unfortunate and it will not be a blazing streak across the sky as the media may at times encourage him to expect. Uh, but if he accepts the fact that the comet is going to be there for a certain few weeks, uh, and only certain times when it will be accessible from our Canadian latitudes, uh, then he should be able to uh, watch it for that interval and uh, enjoy it, perhaps make uh, observations of some value with cameras or other observations. So the thing is, I guess, that we're sure that Halley's Comet will be back to visit us in 1986. The question is, will you see it? And Ian, maybe we should address this fact. Is it going to be that easy to see? Dr. Halliday doesn't think so. It's going to be difficult to see, in fact. Um, we have, uh, has been observed, of course, in the largest telescopes on the Earth. Uh, it was uh, first recovered, as we use in astronomical terms, back on October 20th of 1982. And uh, the largest telescopes on our planet are able to see it. But uh, when it's going to become visible to small telescopes, or in particular to the naked eye, which is, I think, what a lot of people want to, to see it with, that's another question. Uh, probably in late 1985, it will come within in the range of amateur telescopes. But what about naked eye? It's going to be a spectacular sight. Will it fill the sky? Well, I think we're going to have problems with that. Um, we can perhaps look at a, a slide which shows the orbit of the comet and where it's going with respect to the, uh, the sun and the orbits of the, of the Earth. Um, in this uh, diagram, uh, the sun is at the center. Uh, we have the circular orbit of the Earth around it. And then that curved line that goes around is the orbit of the comet. The comet is coming in from sort of the right-hand side of our picture. It's going to swing around the sun and then pass out into the outer reaches of the solar system. Now, it's important to realize for this particular return of Halley's Comet, it has been calculated this is probably the worst return of the comet in 1,000 years. And the why, reason, why is that? And the reason is that in, uh, in our diagram, the sun, the comet, when it's going to be at its brightest, when it's closest to the sun, is going to be opposite the sun to us. That means when it's at its brightest, when its tail is going to be the most magnificent, we're not going to be able to see it. It's going to be too close to the sun. And we're going to have to wait until the comet moves, either just before it reaches that point or whether after it passes by the sun before we see it. Now, in our next slide, we can see that the, the comet's orbit uh, is rather uh, interesting. It's, the comet's orbit does not lie in the same plane as the Earth's orbit. And in fact, the, the comet's orbit is coming from below the plane of the Earth's orbit. It uh, swings up above the orbital plane of our, our planet and then um, passes out into, into space. And it's interesting to note in this picture that Halley's Comet is still outside the orbit of Saturn. It hasn't even 
gone past Saturn yet, and within two years it'll be uh, inside the orbit of the Earth. Yeah, of, of its uh, period of 76 years, it spends almost the entire time in the outer reaches of the solar system. The time that it's, say, inside the orbit of Mars is numbered in the order of months, in fact. Now, what, what, what about seeing it from Toronto? What are we going to be able to see? Well, unfortunately, this particular return of Halley's Comet is not really favorable for northern hemisphere observers. Uh, the time that's going to be naked eye, as far as observers in southern Ontario is concerned, will be in the early part of January. And our next slide shows this particular uh, uh, position of the comet in the sky. Um, in, uh, in January, in the evening sky, uh, we're going to have uh, down in the southwestern part of the sky, uh, as we pass through the month of January, the comet's going to be getting closer and closer to the horizon. It will not be especially bright. It's not going to be like a you know, brightest star you can see in the sky or anything like that. Uh, you're going to really have to have good sky conditions, uh, ideally be away from the city of Toronto or any large city in order to see it. Uh, January will be the best time for us to observe it. Unfortunately, of course, as we all know, January is usually not a very good month for sky conditions. Uh, you know, we might have maybe three or four clear nights in a, in a month of January. Okay, so maybe we have to pass by January. Now into, um, now the comet's going to swing in towards the sun, and at the beginning of February, it's going to be at its closest distance to the sun. Uh, around February 9th, we won't be able to see it at all. And then after February 9th, it comes back into the sky again. And our next slide actually shows this. Uh, this time it's in the morning sky, it's looking towards the, uh, if we look towards the southeastern part of the sky, uh, we can, we'll be able to see it kind of swinging in a low arc uh, across the, well, sort of the southeastern, southern horizon over the course of perhaps two weeks. Um, then it, we don't see it again for a little while, and then it swings into our evening sky, which we see in our next slide. Um, and at this point, the tail is getting very s small, hardly noticeable, the comet is fading very rapidly, and then it'll be gone. All within a few weeks? All within, yeah, really a few weeks. Uh, and each one of those uh, times, early January, uh, late March, early April, and late April, we're only talking maybe about uh, maybe five weeks or so. In the last 15, 20 seconds, Ian, you saw your first comet in 1970. How did it strike you? How did uh, comet well, my, my, my comet was Bennett, and that was my very first comet. Incredible sight in the sky. It, was, it appeared almost like a dagger in the sky. It's something a person can almost be afraid of, in fact, seeing it, unless you know that this is actually just an enormous ball of gas and dust orbiting around the sun. It was an incredible sight. My impression of Comet West in 1975 was as if someone took a little paintbrush and just dabbed a bit of silver paint in the sky with little filaments on it. It was quite beautiful. Well, Ian, thanks very much. Again, our time goes too quickly. I want to thank Ian McGregor from the McLaughlin Planetarium. My name is Randy Atwood with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. We'll see you next time on Astronomy Toronto.